Bayu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome brother Sanja. Thank you very much. How uh, was your uh, Eid celebration? Alhamdulillah, good. What about yours? You celebrated in Istanbul or in the U.S.? I uh, arrived in the uh, U.S. with my wife and we celebrated in the U.S. Mashallah. In masjid, in mosque? Yes, uh, the masjid uh, has two levels, so they had the women on top and the men on the bottom, and uh, it was completely full. Uh, all, uh, a lot of people came. Mashallah, mashallah. Uh, what about uh, in Iraq? How uh, you use it, uh, did you use it to celebrate? Uh, in Iraq, they uh, celebrate also by going to the masjid, and if the weather is nice, uh, they pray also outside. Uh, it's a very big gathering, and some people, after the prayer, they go to the cemetery. Cemetery? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, give salam to the relatives who passed away. Mm, okay. So, in my uh, in Uzbekistan, mostly people visit to each other, the neighbors and relatives visit to each, uh, each other's house and celebrate together. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. That's wonderful. That's very nice to hear. Yeah. Um, but so, in, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, begin the class by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to our Alaykum. class. Uh, alaikum assalam. ITKI 6204, Sociology of Religion and Culture. Today is uh, Sunday, 17 July 2022. Uh, and I am honored and happy to uh, see you uh, in my class today and to have you join in the lecture and discussion and the questions and answers. I would like to point out that uh, the uh, what I want from you uh, is uh, this week to give me, to send me by email, uh, the draft of your research paper. So if you remember, I asked you to do a research paper uh, and it is due on the last day of class, but I want to see just the first draft, the what you have written so far, if it is a little bit or a lot, whatever you have, just send it to me uh, at the latest by uh, Sunday of next week. And I will write this also in the uh, Telegram group. Uh, I will uh, mention this uh, by uh, telling people uh, to send the draft. So let me uh, look at this here. If I go to Telegram, uh, forward to sociology, send. So, dear students, please send me the draft of your research paper due by next, oh, this says next Saturday. I should change it to next Sunday. Delete. Okay. Uh, let's go back and... Uh, do it differently. Okay, copy, text, sociology of religion and culture, paste, do by next, S-U-N-D-A-Y. Okay, so I sent the request on the, <coughs> uh, I sent you the request on Telegram to remind you to uh, send me the draft of your research paper uh, between now and next Sunday. Uh, and I hope everyone had a great uh, Eid celebration. Uh, I missed you last class, uh, but it is good to know that uh, most people or all people were able to have time to spend with their families and loved ones and friends and neighbors uh, during the Eid al-Adha 
uh, holiday. Uh, <clears throat> today for our class for Sociology of Religion and Culture, uh, we are going to focus on the Hajj on Eid al-Adha as well. Uh, as you know, uh, it is one of the main celebrations in Muslim culture. Uh, and uh, Muslims around the world, no matter where they are, no matter what language they speak, no matter what their background is, uh, they engage in uh, the celebration of Eid al-Adha, the Eid of Sacrifice, the holy day that recognizes uh, Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Abraham, and the willingness of the Prophet to fulfill the wish of Allah to kill his um, his son, and then Allah told him at the last moment, "Don't kill your son, uh, make a sacrifice." Uh, and uh, as you know, sacrifice means when you uh, kill the animal or uh, share uh, the bounties. It is uh, given to poor people; it is not thrown away. Uh, people just look at the sacrifice itself as the killing part, but in fact, the that is only part of it. The real part or the main part or the uh, important part is the sharing part. So the food is cooked uh, and shared and distributed uh, and given uh, to people, particularly uh, poor people, the needy people. <clears throat> and this has been happening throughout human history. Uh, but the problem with uh, some of the things in human history, some have been very good. Uh, which is the idea of caring for your family uh, and protecting yourself and your tribe uh, and your clan from uh, things that would uh, threaten it. But some of the things that developed in human history uh, were a problem, such as uh, in many cases, uh, people adopted the practice of sacrificing their child, particularly their son or their oldest son, meaning they kill the child as a way to say thank you to the uh, gods and the uh, idols and the uh, pagan worship that they engaged in, uh, which was uh, a problematic thing. Uh, human beings are being killed uh, supposedly for a good thing to say thank you uh, to whoever is providing humanity with food and with shelter and with safety, but what is being killed is a human being. And as we know, both in Islam and outside of Islam, <clears throat> the most precious and the most valuable uh, and the most amazing thing that we have, the greatest gift that our Creator has given us is life. Life is ir irreplaceable. Uh, life uh, is uh, beyond value. It is, uh, you cannot put a price tag on your life. And no matter how much somebody gives you and says, I'll give you this much money uh, in exchange for uh, getting you killed. Uh, nobody's going to accept that. Now, there are cases where you may be willing to sacrifice your life for your family, for a loved one, or if you are uh, fighting a war to uh, protect uh, your land, that's different. That's a voluntary sacrifice of your own life. Uh, but in terms of... Uh, killing somebody, uh, taking their life, this is completely unacceptable. Uh, and throughout the Abrahamic tradition, the religions of uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, as well as other faiths, uh, the taking of a life is considered haram. It is wrong. It is unacceptable. It is a huge sin uh, to take somebody's life or to commit suicide. Suicide is also considered completely unacceptable. So let us look at uh, the idea of the uh, holiday of sacrifice, Eid al-Adha, and also the idea of Hajj from the point of view of uh, sociology of religion. Uh, how many of you have uh, done Hajj or Umrah? Any of you have uh, been to Mecca and done the rituals? Okay, yes, uh, Halima. Uh, but you may also may have known somebody who uh, has done it from your friends or relatives. Uh, this is, as you know, uh, Hajj is one of the pillars of Islam. Any Muslim who is able to do it, who has enough money and good health uh, and the ability to travel, then uh, they are required by Allah to perform the Hajj. Alhamdulillah, I was able to perform the Hajj 
many times. That was one of the benefits of living in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is uh, something that is controlled. Not everybody, uh, even though they have the money and they are healthy and they are able to travel, is allowed to uh, perform Hajj. Each country has a quota, has a certain number of people that it is allowed to send uh, in terms of pilgrims for Hajj uh, as determined by the uh, negotiations with the Saudi government, the Ministry of uh, Hajj and uh, Endowments. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, also a political issue. So Hajj becomes politicized because it's a matter of negotiation between uh, Saudi Arabia and the uh, other country, how many pilgrims e the country can send uh, to, uh, to Mecca for uh, performing uh, the Hajj. Uh, countries that are stronger or more influential will more likely get uh, higher numbers than other countries who are weaker or uh, poorer or uh, less uh, able to negotiate well with the uh, Saudi authorities. Of course, the Saudi authorities, they want to limit the numbers because if the numbers are unlimited, uh, the place cannot handle uh, the large numbers. And there are, are, there are projects in Mecca. Uh, you may have seen them in pictures or in videos <coughs> for expanding the uh, mosque, the uh, masjid in Mecca, and also the masjid in Medina, but particularly in Mecca, there is an ongoing massive expansion project uh, which is trying to uh, make it easier for the pilgrims, uh, for the people coming for Hajj or who want to pray in the, uh, the Haram, the mosque in Mecca, to uh, do that uh, because now there is uh, space limitations. Uh, if you look at history, uh, in the past, uh, as we know or we are told by the Quran, uh, Prophet Ibrahim established the Kaaba, right? The uh, square structure that is in the middle of the masjid uh, in Mecca. And essentially, it has stayed the same uh, throughout uh, all this time. Uh, it's gone through some modifications. At some points in human history, in Muslim history, it was destroyed. But essentially, it is that same uh, black, uh, that same uh, uh, square structure in Mecca with the section, a uh, small part, uh, the black stone, Al-Hajar Al-Aswad, the black rock, uh, which is uh, believed to have come from outer space, a uh, meteorite uh, or a similar rock uh, that crashed and uh, this black stone was placed in uh, one of the corners uh, of, the, uh, of the Kaaba. Uh, and there is uh, some discussion, uh, we talk about this sometimes in the class on uh, Ijtihad renewal and modernity. Some Muslims um, try their best to go and kiss the black stone, uh, while other Muslims say that it's just too crowded uh, and uh, it's not necessary. It's not a requirement of the Hajj or Umrah. Uh, it's not uh, something that is essential. Uh, to the ritual. Uh, some people do it, they say, because the Prophet ﷺ did it. Other people say uh, it is uh, something that uh, we don't need to do. Uh, it's not a requirement and, and it's too much of a headache for security. And it holds up the uh, circular, uh, cir the circumambulation of the Kaaba. So during Tawaf, during uh, the circles you make around the Kaaba, you want the the circling to be smooth and to be continuous. But the people trying to go and kiss the black rock, they create all kinds of obstacles and problems, and there's pushing and shoving. Uh, and so it's really a, a big headache in many ways. Uh, from the point of view of sociology of religion, uh, as scholars, we ask ourselves, uh, basically, uh, what are people doing and why are they doing it? Uh, and what uh, will most likely happen in the future. So in the field of sociology, uh, we can say that, uh, and here I will give you a little overview of the science of sociology. Sociology is a social science. That means we are scientists. 
What does that mean that we are scientists? It means we are looking for the truth using the experimental method, looking at facts, discovering the facts, trying to explain the facts, and then uh, understand what might happen in the future or predict the future. So any science, including sociology, begins with uh, description, figuring out what the facts are. So we have many studies now that look at how many people go to Hajj every year, uh, how many from each country, uh, how many men, how many women, uh, to what extent do people repeat the Hajj. So we have a situation where some people never get to go to Hajj or uh, it's very hard for them to find a place while other people, for some reason, they go once, twice, thrice, many times. The people who live inside Saudi Arabia, they can go as many times as they want. The Saudi government does not restrict them. The people outside Saudi Arabia mostly uh, don't get to go to Hajj or get to go once, but some actually get to go multiple times. So here we have a differentiation uh, in uh, a situation of inequality, imbalance, uh, between uh, the requirement on the one hand for every Muslim, uh, they have to go to Hajj, and then the reality is some don't get to go and some get to go uh, multiple times. So uh, we start with the facts in any science, including sociology. Then we try to understand these facts. So the facts include, you know, the answers to the question who, what, when, where, why, how. Right? Who gets to go to Hajj? When does the Hajj takes place? Uh, why are people, some people able to go and some people uh, not able to go? Uh, and then uh, where do people come to go to Hajj? Uh, and then how do people get to Hajj? Right? These are just the facts. Uh, we call it description. Then the next level up is to take all these facts and to say, okay, how do we explain them? How do we answer the question of why? Why do uh, some people get to go uh, and others don't? Why are some people able to uh, have enough money to go and others do not? Uh, why is it that some people who go to Hajj, uh, they're sponsored by the Saudi government and the, or they have enough money to live in very nice hotels, five-star hotels, uh, and travel in air-conditioned buses while other people uh, they stay in uh, places that are very far from the masjid. Uh, there's no air conditioning. Lots of people are put in the same room, sharing one bathroom, uh, old facilities. They have to walk anytime they uh, want to go anywhere. Uh, they cannot afford the taxi or the air conditioned uh, buses, uh, and so on. So here we have uh, discrepancy. We have uh, differences uh, between it's the same Muslims they're all Muslims they're all trying to fulfill the Hajj duty but based upon money based upon financial resources some people get to have a more comfortable experience than other people so by explaining uh, the facts we get a better understanding of what's uh, going on uh, another issue is uh, Hajj is uh, involves the most important mosque for Muslims, the most holiest site for Muslims, which is the Kaaba, the mosque uh, surrounding the Kaaba. We call it in Arabic Al-Haram Al-Makki, the Meccan uh, holy place. Uh, and so any religious uh, building, any religious site is supposed to be a sanctuary. It's supposed to be a place of safety. Uh, and that is why when uh, you look at the history of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, Prophet Muhammad tried to have peace with the people who were uh, against him. So the tribe of Quraysh, the tribe of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was controlling Mecca. They were pagans. They were idol worshippers. Uh, they were kuffar and mushrikeen. Uh, and there's a distinction in between those two. Kuffar is those who deny uh, the existence of a creator. Mushrikeen are those who say, yes, there is a God, but we uh, worship uh, idols to uh, get our uh, prayers. The idol will convey it to God. So there's an intermediary. So that's why they're called Mushrik, uh, associators, uh, idolaters. So the 
Kuffar and the Mushrikeen, the Kafirs and the Mushriks of Quraysh were against uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his message. And one of the things that they wouldn't uh, let the Muslims do is to perform uh, Umrah and Hajj. So the Prophet signed a peace treaty with them that said, okay, in the beginning Muslims will not come, and then later on they will come, but with no weapons, until finally the Prophet, peace be upon him, was able to conquer Mecca uh, and uh, do the uh, entire Hajj ritual uh, in safety. So one of the parts of the agreement was to continue this tradition among the Arabs that uh, the area of Mecca, the area uh, of the Haram, of the mosque, is a sanctuary. That means nobody can kill you there. You're not allowed to kill anybody there. You're not allowed to uh, catch animals there and kill them. It is a place of complete peace, tranquility, and safety. So until the Day of Judgment, any religious institution is supposed to be a place of sanctuary. And this is also true, for example, for churches. So in Europe, uh, at least in the past, there were so many wars in Europe. Uh, and during these wars, the innocent civilians who didn't want to fight, didn't want to get killed, many times they would go to the churches and stay inside the church to avoid the fighting. Uh, most of the time this was uh, accepted and respected, but sometimes, uh, especially for example, we see in World War II, uh, Hitler and the Nazi party of uh, Germany at that time, they did not respect the sanctity, the holiness, the uh, idea that the church is a place where nobody uh, is supposed to attack it. They would attack churches, they would burn the church, and everybody inside would die uh, and would uh, have a terrible suffering. So unfortunately, there are exceptions to the rule of a holy site being a sanctuary, a place of peace, uh, and a place of refuge. But in general, this is uh, a common uh, theme uh, among religions around the world, especially the Abrahamic religions. Uh, what we are seeing, unfortunately, again, is a revival of the horrible uh, war crimes and terrible things that are done during war. The Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, is a terrible and horrible and uh, human rights disaster, uh, completely unacceptable. And we are in solidarity with our Ukrainian brothers and sisters. We hope for them success and uh, we hope for them uh, safety. And we hope for uh, our Ukrainian brothers and sisters victory against the uh, horrible uh, Russian invasion that is uh, taking place. So getting back to uh, Mecca and uh, the Hajj uh, and uh, celebrations like Eid al-Adha, Sociologists try to make sense of these uh, events, uh, of these uh, uh, aspects of the faith, uh, and they do it by description and then explanation. And then the final level is once you understood why something is, take place, is taking place, okay, for example, we can ask the question as sociologists, why do Muslims go around the Kaaba seven times uh, during Hajj and Umrah? What is the significance of this? And even before that, uh, Muslims who are going to uh, perform Hajj and Umrah have to do something called Ihram, wearing the pure clothes, right? So before you come uh, to Mecca, outside uh, of Mecca, there are areas, places where you would change all your clothes and you would wear these pure white clothes uh, that in Arabic are called uh, Ihram. Uh, for uh, women and men, uh, it basically it's plain clothes. Uh, and uh, the idea then, uh, or the question then is, you know, why are people asked to take off their regular clothes and they're only allowed to wear plain cloth, okay? So as sociologists, we can look at different theories. Uh, when people are wearing the same thing, it is uh, what... Uh, uh, might be called leveling. That means everybody, whether rich or poor, whether tall or short, whether uh, big or small, whether strong or weak, everybody becomes on the same level. The clothes, rather than being a way of showing differences between people, now became become an equalizer. 
everybody is essentially wearing the same thing. Uh, and therefore, everybody, uh, at least from the outside, is equal. So here we have an explanation for ihram, for wearing the plain uh, clothes without any jewelry, without any uh, differentiation from one person to another. And then we can look at uh, its effects and its uh, future and its uh, potential. Uh, so we can say, well, when we learn this during Hajj uh, or Umrah, then we can apply it outside of Hajj and Umrah. Uh, so we try in our lives to be humble. And one way to show humility is rather than showing off how much uh, money or how fashionable we are in our clothes, we uh, try to find something simple, clean, uh, good clothes, uh, but at the same time, uh, clothes that are... Uh, nice looking and simple and are not meant to show off how much money we have or how much we are into the latest fashion uh, as you know some men or women uh, they put a lot of emphasis on the brand name uh, and you may know some of these brand names like uh, gucci or burberry or armani uh, or other uh, brand names right these are companies that make uh, expensive clothes and uh, and bags and shoes uh, and why do people wear them maybe the quality is the same as something else or um, maybe it's not even comfortable but the idea is you are showing off or you are saying to others you see I have this uh, handbag or I have this uh, shirt from a brand name so uh, that means uh, somehow I am uh in a better situation i know better or i have more money or i am uh, more fashionable uh, it's it's one way of showing off what hajj is trying to teach us and umrah is maybe we should rethink these behaviors and we should still wear nice clothes clean clothes uh, good clothes but not the kinds of clothes you used to show off but more uh, simple and meaningful clothes. I just came back from a trip to uh, uh, the United Kingdom and Turkey and Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and it was amazing in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan people are wearing very nice clothes but they are simple and they show the person to be very respectable uh, men and women and uh, very uh, uh, attractive but it is simple clothes. And in Turkey, in Istanbul, in Turkey, uh, my wife and I and her family, we went to a mall uh, that is uh, a fashion mall, uh, but it's for a hijab. Uh, so all kinds of uh, women's uh, fashions for uh, practicing Muslim women were there. And uh, they were nice looking, the clothes but not meant to show off or to attract attention, but to make the person look respectable, uh, look, uh, look very nice while having the proper modesty and the proper covering. So this is something that is indicative of uh, every society. In every society, people wear different kinds of clothes. This is true around the world. And in the anthropology of Islam, we look at how in each society, uh, clothing can be a signifier. So uh, in some tribes or in some village uh, societies, uh, you have, for example, the king and queen, they have to wear certain clothes. And then the people who serve them wear certain clothes. And then the fighters and the warriors, they wear certain clothes. So uh, in, in sociology, we look at how clothing uh, is affected by society and how society is affected by clothing, okay? So society, when we are growing up, uh, other people, the media, uh, TV, magazines, our parents, uh, the neighbors, they are influencing us to wear certain clothes and also we uh, can also influence society based upon uh, what kinds of things, of choices we make. So when people buy a lot of uh, expensive uh, name brand, uh, high-end uh, jewelry and clothing, uh, this uh, means that there is a big demand uh, and there is a push toward these uh, so-called fashion items to show off. 
Whereas if less people are buying these items, then companies start to cater to more practical uh, and to more simple uh, types of uh, clothing styles. Uh, I know all of you know more, of me, uh, more, more than me about this. Uh, clothing is not my uh, specialty, uh, but you can see whether it's in Africa or Asia or Europe or North and South America, a fascinating variety of clothes uh, and styles. And in each society, you can be humble and wear nice clothes, or you could, through your clothes, okay, you can show off. Uh, you can, uh, unfortunately, uh, if you uh, have this uh, attitude of uh, uh, being, uh, instead of humble, being arrogant, uh, the one way to show arrogance is through uh, the clothing, whether it's a political leader showing off their power or a uh, social leader showing off how fashionable they are or a wealthy person uh, an economic, uh, uh, an economically uh, well-endowed person, a rich person, uh, can show off how much money they have by using gold and silver and other items uh, and certain cloth uh, in their uh, in their uh, clothing style. Now, uh, beyond clothing, uh, Hajj uh, and uh, the ritual surrounding Hajj involved the largest gathering of Muslims coming together on earth at the same time. Uh, it might be happening in other religions. So we know, for example, in uh, the Hindu religion, there are even bigger gatherings than uh, Muslims have in Hajj. But it is one of the few gatherings on earth where people are coming uh, for the same purpose, uh, to engage in a series of rituals that are ultimately designed to bring you closer to uh, your creator, to get closer uh, and uh, to have a better relationship with Allah and to uh, have an experience that will transform you so that uh, your spirit is uplifted uh, and your soul is uh, given a lot of energy in order to continue in, with your life. Uh, your life may have been uh, good spiritually, but now after Hajj and Umrah, uh, the idea is to make it even better, even higher level. So all of us have a spirit and a soul inside our body. It needs support. It needs to be uh, revived and renewed. And Hajj and Umrah are uh, the ultimate ways of doing this. Uh, we have ways of spiritually uh, improving ourselves every day, of course, through prayer and through fasting and through giving... Uh, the poor do the zakat, but the Hajj and Umrah are the uh, most uh, amazing manifestations and rituals that are designed specifically for that purpose. However, in sociology of religion and culture, we also look at the various elements. What is promoting the spiritual development and uh, at the same time, what might be hindering it? Uh, so uh, when, you, when we look at uh, Hajj, uh, we can ask ourselves, <clears throat> if we want to have the best spiritual experience during Hajj, what has to happen so that we can achieve that? And the converse of that question is, if we are not achieving the highest level of spiritual upliftment and improvement during Hajj, what are some of the reasons that are causing that? Or what would hinder us from or prevent us or stop us from having uh, the highest level spiritual uh, experience possible. Uh, these can be explored uh, through the various uh, types of questions that we ask in sociology of religion. Now, just as a basic understanding of sociology uh, in the area of theory, so when sociology explains something, uh, they have different theories, okay? Uh, sociology, as you know, is a social science, meaning it's unlike the natural science. So the natural sciences like biology, physics, chemistry are highly developed. Uh, the formulas are well uh, studied and the uh, basics are agreed upon and pretty much uh, it's building on uh, a, a set of knowledge that Allah has provided humanity 
where uh, physics and chemistry and biology uh, have a set of known facts uh, and these facts are increasing and explanations are uh, being developed. Uh, there's not much controversy within those fields. It exists, but not so much. In the social sciences, there are many more variables, many more things that are changing. So a lot of things are still not understood or misunderstood, or there's disagreement about why uh, things are going the way they are going. So if you look at our world, we are living in, in a world. There's the natural world, and then we have the human uh, world. The natural world, as you can see, uh, if it is uh, pristine and untouched, it's wonderful. It's a, what is called an ecosystem in biology where it continues by itself. Uh, but what is happening is there has been human interference, especially in the last 200 years, which is causing pollution, which is causing destruction. The forests are being destroyed. The water is being polluted. Uh, and so the huge rate of destruction against the environment that human beings are doing means in one or two or three generations, there will be no more food and no more clean water. And so humanity will die off. So, and this, is, this has never happened in human history. This is the first time in human history where within the next hundred years, humanity will end because we have destroyed our uh, environment. So <clears throat> we have problems like environmental crisis. We have problems like wars. We have issues like refugees. We have all kinds of things going on in the world that are negative, and we have things that are going on that are positive. So uh, in the area of medicine, there, uh, uh, humans are continuously finding new ways to treat disease and prevent disease and to solve problems in our bodies. Uh, and in terms of uh, travel, we are uh, developing new systems of travel that are uh, safer and faster. Uh, like the fast speed trains or like what they're developing in terms of helicopter taxis uh, and electrical vehicles. So there's a lot of development in some areas and there's a lot of uh, problems in some other areas. What would uh, sociology of religion be able to do uh, along those lines? Uh, because as I had mentioned before, I am here as a teacher to share with you information but a lot of my information you can get from so many sources, especially on the internet and other speakers. But the idea is to use that information to make the world a better place. Ultimately, that's what our religion requires us to learn, yes, but not just to learn uh, and end there, but to use our knowledge to, to share it and then to take our knowledge and to share it and to, to work with other people to solve our problems, to make the world a better place. How can learning about Hajj or going to Hajj make the world a better place? In the past, when Hajj, because Hajj brought Muslims from around the world, uh, whom they would otherwise never see and never meet, it was an opportunity to learn. So people from all over the Muslim world would come together and share with each other. Uh, they shared economic ideas, political ideas, social ideas, uh, all kinds of ways to become more spiritual, to become better in terms of our psychology, to create better communities, have better business, and to uh, improve the political systems. This was happening every single time in Hajj until it stopped when the current government of Saudi Arabia took over kicked out the Sharif uh, of Mecca, and then Hajj became very controlled. You could not have meetings, you could not have seminars, you could not have gatherings. You could only go there, do the rituals, and then leave, okay? You might have a small meeting with your family or some friends, uh, but nothing uh, announced and formal, and uh, no uh, events before, during, or after Hajj uh, that... Uh, are there to uh, increase the knowledge and to uh, help the Ummah solve, solve its problems. Uh, and this, uh, in, in a big sense, is a huge tragedy because we have some real issues facing the Ummah and we need gatherings like the Hajj so that the best minds of the Ummah and the wide variety of opinions can come together uh, and share with each other uh, and be able to 
find solutions. So if you ask yourself now, what is the biggest gathering uh, that I have been to in my life? What is the biggest collection of people that I have uh, been able to meet in my life at, in, in one uh, event? So it, it might be uh, aid, right? It might be uh, weddings, it might be funerals, it might be a conference where there are thousands of people. Uh, it might be a lecture. Uh, there's various uh, occasions where we might see a lot of people. Uh, and that is an opportunity. Unfortunately, Hajj has uh, been deprived of that opportunity. Muslims can no longer take advantage of the Hajj to uh, meet each other in order to uh, solve uh, the various problems of the Ummah. Another thing here I could add in terms of the sociology of religion, uh, when we try to understand uh, anything that humans do, sociologists have come up with different theories, but there are three main theories in sociology that are dominant uh, today. And this applies to any uh, area of sociology. So <clears throat> one, one theory is called structural functionalism so let me write this in the comments so that you know what i am referring to okay by the way before i start talking about uh, social theories any questions at this point comments uh, thoughts responses everything clear so far Okay. okay, so I have uh, sent you in the chat three of the biggest uh, and most influential and most common theories in sociology. So let's begin with this one called structural functionalism. What does it mean or, or how does it work or... Uh, what, it, what does it involve? So for structural functionalists, for people who are using this theory of structural functionalism, the idea is you take an event like Hajj and you ask, you ask about its structure and its function. Now what do they mean by its structure? They mean the relationships between the people. So uh, any institution, any group of human beings uh, that are together with a common goal, okay, has a structure, means there's a set of relationships. So you look at the family. The family in sociology is considered an institution. Why does it, why is it called an institution? Because it is a group of people uh, that have particular relationships with each other and that has a history, okay? If you get together with friends, we don't call that an, an institution, even though it's people coming together. But if it has a history and it's a particular set of relationships, we call that an institution. So the family is an institution, school is an institution, uh, religious organizations like the mosque or the Catholic Church are an institution. So there's all kinds of institutions in society. Uh, Hajj is an institution, right? It is a religious event. People are coming, certain set of rituals, they do certain activities. And the goal is to become uh, closer to our Creator and to have the spiritual upliftment uh, that will sustain uh, a person for the rest of their life to being a good person. <clears throat> so the structural functionalist will say, okay, what is the structure of Hajj, meaning what are the relationships between the people there? Who is there and how do they relate to each other? Okay, so one thing that the structural functionalist might point out is that in Hajj, uh, there is a, a huge uh, equalizing effect. All the people coming, regardless of their money and their power and how famous they are, once they are in Hajj, pretty much they're all the same. They, they look the same, the clothes are the same, they go through the same rituals. Uh, there's nothing that clearly differentiates them. Okay, So structurally, they relate to each other as brothers and sisters and uh, they uh, have a commonality. 
the tawaf, they go around the Kaaba seven times, they do the sa'i uh, seven times, the uh, uh, the running between the, the hills of Safa and Marwa, they do the stoning of the devil, uh, the rajim, uh, and you have uh, uh, the uh, visits to uh, not just Mecca, but Muzdalifa, Mina, Arafat, there's the night of uh, night on the mountain where you engage in dua all together. So structurally, uh, everybody is more or less being equalized. Okay, the relationships are relationships of equality. Okay, uh, and you're not allowed to bring to Hajj your worldly things and show them off. Right, you, you, you're supposed to look as plain as possible and you're supposed to be as humble as possible. Then there's the other half, the functional part, okay? Uh, the functional part asks the question is, uh, and that is, what function does it serve? Uh, what is it trying to achieve? What does it do for the people involved? So for example, uh, what is the function of going around the Kaaba seven times? What is the function of the Sa'i? What is the function of stoning of the devil? Uh, I was there uh, for Hajj many times in my life. Uh, and so I was there uh, in the place for stoning of the devil. You're supposed to pick up, you know, a, uh, some small rocks and then throw it at this big pillar that represents the devil. So this is an event. Uh, it's a part of the Hajj ritual. Uh, and the question is, what is its function? What is the meaning uh, of uh, and the function, not the meaning, what is the function? What does it achieve when you're throwing these rocks at a piece of a big rock? Uh, on the surface, it might seem strange or unusual or um, useless uh, because uh, it's nothing extraordinary uh, on the surface. But then when you dig deeper, then you realize that this is psychologically and socially you are part of a big group uh, and you are all indicating a rejection of evil you see it's different than if i'm sitting at home and i say you know uh, as every muslim should rajim, i reject and uh, stay away from the devil uh, and evil but this is an event where Millions of people are coming together and doing it uh, over various periods of time, but essentially together they are rejecting evil. So the stoning of the devil uh, has a function, and that function is to uh, reject evil, meaning change our lives so that we are trying to stay away as much as possible from bad things, from evil, uh, and that includes the evil inside of us and the evil outside of us. So it also has the function of ridding our brain of evil thoughts and uh, the accumulation of uh, evil things that might have uh, affected our psychology, our thinking, our brain. So if somebody says to themselves, I am weak, I am uh, unable to do important things, I cannot solve any problem, this is... Uh, uh, you are demeaning yourself uh, and by stoning the devil you are saying I reject this I have my creator my creator gives me uh, great blessings and power uh, and I should always depend on my creator so I should never make myself denigrated and I do that by rejecting uh, all these uh, bad things that the devil or uh, that my uh, uh, evil side is trying to uh, put into me okay so you so here so then we go back to this uh, theory of structural functionalism it's explaining something like Hajj by looking at the relationships of the people the structure and the function of what is being done uh, meaning looking at what it is trying to achieve now there's another theory called Marxism and Marxist theory is uh, all a whole bunch of ideas that have been attributed to uh, Karl Marx, who was the most influential uh, European uh, sociologist uh, in in the past hundred years. Uh, and Marxist theory uh, can look at something like Hajj uh, and try to identify any 
uh, levels of injustice or uh, uh, differentiation between people. So what Marxist theory tries to do is it tries to find out if there's any exploitation, any uh, type of uh, denigration, any type of uh, stronger human beings exerting power over weaker human beings. And uh, according to Marxist theory, if you look at Hajj, uh, in many ways it uh, the Hajj is uh, very much getting rid of injustice and exploitation and denigration uh, and racism uh, and uh, the creation of walls between uh, different human beings. Uh, the Hajj, in the way it's done, uh, and in terms of the intentions of its people, the whole point is to reduce barriers rather than create barriers, okay? To bring people together rather than uh, put them apart. So in our normal life, rich people might be uh, away from poor people and powerful people might be away from weak people. In the Hajj, all people are brought together. So in that sense, according to Marxist theory, Hajj serves as a, a great uh, way to uh, get rid of exploitation and to get rid of injustice uh, and to get rid of uh, the creation of barriers between people. That's one way that Marxist theory might uh, function uh, when, uh, might uh, operate when uh, looking at Hajj. And finally, uh, in terms of symbolic interactionism, uh, the theory looks at two things. What symbols are being used and uh, how uh, this is affecting the interaction between the people that are uh, engaged uh, in the event, okay? So, uh, in the ideas of symbolic interactionists, from the point of view of symbolic interactionists, uh, one of the questions that might be asked is, what kind of symbols are uh, used in Hajj? So, you have the, the clothing, that's one kind of symbol, okay? We talked about the stoning of the uh, devil uh, and the use of rocks, uh, which are tiny objects, which uh, normally would not be a problem for people, uh, but in fact are used symbolically to get rid of evil uh, and to uh, destroy uh, bad things in our lives. And then you can uh, look at also uh, the uh, the slaughter of animals, the udhiya, the uh, distribution of meat. Uh, what does that symbolize? It symbolizes that uh, people are part of a society where one has to share. Okay, so the the sacrifice symbolizes sharing, and also it symbolizes sharing based upon caring. Okay, uh, as opposed to what? Well, for example, in your country, you might have something called taxes. Right, the government takes money from you, whether you like it or not. You're forced to pay it, and if you don't pay it, uh, the government will hurt you. They will put you in jail. They will uh, uh, take away your money by force. Uh, but the whole point of sacrifice is symbolically you are doing it uh, because of your own choice, which means that you are doing it out of caring for other people. You are sharing. Uh, what you have, uh, and you are uh, sharing what you have in order to, uh, or, or because of uh, your willingness to help other people, because of your care for other people, because of your love for other care for other people. So this idea of love is very powerful, uh, and it is symbolized through uh, the uh, slaughter of the animals uh, on Eid al-Adha, on the Feast of Sacrifice. That's the first half of symbolic interactionism. What about the interactionist part? Uh, the uh, dealing of people with each other. Well, uh, as you uh, are aware in Hajj, uh, people are interacting with each other all the time. Primarily, uh, the Hajjis are interacting with their Lord, with their Creator, right? But uh, during Hajj, uh, there's a huge emphasis on creating an ideal society. So on the one hand, Hajj is like an artificial society 
millions of people come together a certain amount of time, same place, and then they leave. So it's a temporary society. But it is also uh, a very powerful and amazing society because it's very clear in the Quran. Uh, for example, it says, "Fala rafatha wala fasuqa wala jidala fil Hajj." Especially during Hajj, Allah is saying it is completely not allowed to waste your time and to put other people down and to uh, have uh, negative arguments. So the idea is people are coming together to get closer to their creator and to become stronger, have stronger relationships with each other, to come together in the name of brotherhood and sisterhood, to come together in the name of love. Love for each other is hugely emphasized during Hajj. Now, of course, what is supposed to happen is not always equal to what actually happens. That is true. So although Hajj is supposed to be the biggest expression of love for humanity, for each other, Muslims coming together, uh, and despite uh, the distances between uh, where we live and uh, our languages and our colors, uh, and our habits, but the Hajj is trying to say, despite all of this, there is love between you two, between everybody there, and it should be put into practice. One should uh, approach and interact with and love uh, a fellow Hajji as if they are somebody they know for their whole life and they are best friends, okay? Does this happen? Yes. Does it always happen? No. Uh, so we can talk about how Islam wants the Hajj to be and how Hajjis actually operate. So, I mean, Hajj is supposed to be uh, clean and healthy and safe, but we have every year people dying from dehydration and stroke uh, and uh, uh, disease uh, during Hajj. And there are fires that occur every few years. There are uh, times when people stampede. Uh, they start running, and then people uh, fall down and get hurt and killed. So there's there's problems that occur every year during Hajj that should have been prevented, that uh, uh, we wish uh, did not happen. We, we need to emphasize and realize that Hajj is supposed to be safe. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when you uh, go to Hajj, the company or the people that are involved in uh, taking you there, they will tell you about where you will stay and the airplane and the transportation and the cost. But almost none of them, very rarely will they ever tell you about uh, how the dangers of Hajj. Okay, you have to be aware of the very hot sun, uh, very uh, hot weather. You have to be aware that uh, you will be dehydrated. You have to keep drinking water, but you will not always find clean drinking water. Uh, they need to tell you that there's a danger of fire. Uh, there's a danger of being uh, run over if there's a, a stampede of hajjis. All kinds of dangers, especially for older people or very young uh, people. Uh, every year they're killed uh, during hajj. People die, uh, and it's a tragedy. And unfortunately, the government over there does not publish these statistics, does not give you the names of the people who passed away. You don't even know where they are uh, buried. Uh, so one thing to think about before going on Hajj or Umrah is to, is to know uh, we are required to, be, to make ourselves aware of the uh, positive things, of course, and what we need to make it a more uh, successful experience, but also the risks and the hazards uh, that it might entail. Okay, uh, if, uh, if anybody has any questions about our lecture today, please let me know. Let me remind you about uh, the requirement I had made in the beginning between now and next Sunday. Please send me your uh, the draft of your paper, okay? It doesn't have to be complete. It doesn't have to be perfect. Whatever you have, just send it to me by email. Uh, and my job is to help you make it into... A, a good and successful paper so you can get a full grade for this course. Any issues, any uh, concerns? Thank you so much for joining us in this class. It's my honor and pleasure to be your uh, professor. 
uh, and we will try to get uh, the lectures on YouTube as soon as possible. Uh, may Allah bless you. I hope your aid went very well, uh, and I wish you success. And until we meet next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well appreciated, sir.